desk. I'm sorry. It's up above on top of the desk. So I'm ready anytime if you if we want to admit people. Welcome everyone. We're going to be starting in a few minutes, just waiting for some others to join us.
Welcome everyone, we'll be starting in just a few minutes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm David Brownlee. Uh, I'm the president of the board of the Beth Shalom Preservation Foundation. And on behalf of the foundation and of the congregation Beth Shalom, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to this wonderful program this evening. The Preservation Foundation was created under the leadership of the remarkable Herb Sachs, who is today the president of the congregation. Thanks, Herb. And this event was coordinated by the remarkable Jill Rosen, our Director of Tours and Marketing. Thanks, Jill. Um, thanks to, uh, to Stacy Salzman, who is marshalling the electrons that we're using this evening. The foundation is a non-sectarian, not-for-profit organization that was created to help preserve Beth Shalom Synagogue. We work to build public awareness of the remarkable National Historic Landmark that presides over the Delaware Valley from its hill in Elkins Park. To this end, we mount publicly oriented programs like the one you're attending tonight, and we conduct tours. Tours, very carefully designed, physically distanced tours have now resumed. We also have a gift shop that is full of really wonderful Frank Lloyd Wright merchandise, which you can shop for online. To sign up for a tour, to shop in the shop, to join the foundation or just to give us a donation in thanks for this evening's event, just go to bethshalompreservation.org, bethshalompreservation.org. This is the first lecture in our series, Beyond Right, exploring architectural treasures in our community. Our next speaker will be the famous preservation architect, David Hollenberg who has worked for the National Park Service and for the University of Pennsylvania. On Tuesday, March 23rd, David will be speaking about the challenges of preserving modern buildings, buildings like Beth Shalom. Um, he'll be talking about his experience working with buildings designed by Eero Saarinen and Louis Kahn. Uh, don't worry, we'll send you a reminder of that lecture. Tonight, we welcome Jeff Groff who is a state historian at the Wintertour Museum Garden and Library. Jeff is one of the most successful, respected, and beloved leaders of Philadelphia's museum community. 
Before moving to Winterthur in 2006, he was for 16 years the executive director of Wick, uh, of Wick Historic House and Garden uh, in Germantown. Uh, before that, he had been the registrar and assistant curator at the Philadelphia Maritime Museum, what is now the Philadelphia Seaport Museum. And then he was the director of the Osterville Historical Society on Cape, Cape Cod. Jeff was born in Bryn Mawr, and he studied at Bates College where he read history. And his museum career was getting started when he, when he decided to get a master's degree from the Winter Tour program in early American culture at the University of Delaware. And indeed, he still serves as a member of the affiliated faculty at the University of Delaware. His scholarly interests focus on American country houses and gardens, particularly those of Philadelphia's main line. But Jeff is probably best known as the institutional leader who took up the challenge of caring for Wick, the rather small, fragile 18th century house where George Washington never slept located in a neighborhood that most people think of as off the beaten track. And after 16 years of doing that, when Jeff moved on to Winterthur, Wick was still a rather small, fragile 18th century house where Washington never slept, located in a neighborhood that people by then thought was probably just slightly less far off the beaten track. Jeff's huge accomplishment, his huge achievement, was that, Rick, Wick, that Wick survived and prospered during that period. And he accomplished this by devising innovative programming for both Wick's neighbors and for those who came from the wider world by providing exceptional stewardship for the building and for the more than two centuries worth of artifacts that it contains and by leading an outstandingly successful fundraising program. Jeff went to Winterthur as director of public programs and director of interpretation. And in that role, he served as co-curator of the fabulously successful exhibition, Costumes of Downton Abbey in, 19, in 2014 to 2015. He also served as part of the ex exhibition team for Winter Tour's Follies, Architectural Whimsy in the Garden in, 19, in 2018 to 2020. And he served as co-curator the, for the show, Costuming the Crown, in 2019 to 2020. Uh, this evening, he'll be his topic is creating winter tour. If you have questions, please quit, put your questions in the Q&A and we'll put those questions to Jeff after his talk. Jeff, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Take it away. Thank you, David. And I'm delighted to be here this evening, but what a wonderful introduction. Uh, I really appreciate that. Well, I am really looking forward to, to telling you more about Winter Tour. And just as sort of a point of orientation, in case you're not all that familiar with it, I wanted to kind of use this overall view, aerial view, to highlight some of the buildings. And I am going to be particularly looking at architecture. Well, it has this amazing 175 room house. Uh, the first of it built in 1840 and then expanded over several generations to large size that you see now. In 1951, Winter Tour opened as a museum. So the house with some of the collections were now available for a small group of visitors to see. But that meant H.F. DuPont and his wife Ruth needed somewhere to live. They were leaving that house behind. So across the way, they built a 50-room uh, English Regency-style house to be their uh, residence for the rest of their life. Winter Tour was very successful from the get-go in 1951. And as it was expanding, Henry Francis DuPont realized it needed a support building, essentially administrative offices, library, some additional rooms that could be toured. So in 1960, the South Wing, as it was known. The last building that he funded and oversaw was the Crown and Shield Research Building, library, conservation labs, and studios that you see in that blue square now. And then in 1992, Winter Tour added the galleries so they could put on changing exhibitions like Costumes of Downton Abbey and also highlight particular treasures from the collection. 
Well, let's step back just a moment to the very beginning of the DuPont family's involvement with the land. E.I. DuPont, who founded the Gunpowder Works, which was the root of the family fortune, uh, started those about 1802, built his house along the Brandywine River and overlooking the gunpowder mills. But he was also keenly interested in farming. And so about four miles away in 1810, he started buying land to create his sheep farm. And it was specifically Merino sheep. Now this was his prize ram, Don Pedro. And to give you a sense of how significant this sheep was, uh, he had a print made of him that became widely distributed. Statues were created. And when Don Pedro died, Thomas Jefferson sent a sympathy note to E.I. DuPont. Well, E.I. DuPont died in 1834 and his daughter Evelina and her husband Antoine Bitterman were the ones who purchased the property from the estate. Bitterman was a businessman, had been a partner in the gunpowder works, but had decided he wanted to retire from business uh, to pursue scientific agriculture and to create a country place on the 400 acre farm that had belonged to his father-in-law. So they set out to build a house on the property, traveling in 1838 to Paris to see family and friends, and also to commission a notable, notable French architect to design their villa. You can see the watercolor rendering on the left, the plans of the house. It was a very stylish Italianate villa of that period. Well, there's the house is built and completed in 1841 in the black and white photographic image, little bit different. Still the same 12 room floor plan that the architect had conceived, but I think probably to fit in more comfortably with style in Delaware at that time period and the capabilities of the builders, the contractors who were creating it, you can see it was rendered in the Greek revival style. And this 12 room house is still at the core of the Winter Tour house today. Now, Winter Tour then passed through three generations of DuPont family, all named Henry. It gets very confusing if you try and uh, unravel the genealogy of the DuPont family. The first was Boss Henry, so-called because he was president of the Gunpowder Works from 1850 to 1889. And he purchased it not to live there, he lived at Eleutherian Mills, but as an investment in cent, essentially. But then in 1874, his son Henry Algernon married Pauline Foster, uh, a New York socialite, and so Boss Henry offered them the Winter Tour property and the Bitterman House to be their residence. Henry Algernon DuPont, a Civil War hero, uh, later a senator from Delaware in the early 1900s and a very successful businessman, took on the Bitterman House and began some expansion to it. And then the third Henry, Henry Francis DuPont, who really is the one who was responsible for creating the museum, garden, and library that we enjoy today. In April of 1876, uh, H.A., as he was known, and Pauline DuPont moved into the Bitterman house and began to do some renovations. In 1884, they added a full force story to the house now much more stylish, kind of in a European eclecticism. The architect for that change was Theophilus P. Chandler, a name a number of you may recognize, well known in the Philadelphia area and Dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania. It also happened that T.P. Chandler was the brother-in-law of Henry Algernon DuPont, so a pretty logical choice. You see there in the foreground of uh, the two children, Henry Francis and his sister, Louise. 
Well, the next big leap occurred in 1903 and 04 when Henry Algernon DuPont turned Winterthur into a Gilded Age millionaire's mansion. And he was indeed a multimillionaire by that time period. He chose sort of a French Renaissance style. Uh, I think uh, looking back at his own ancestry, the DuPont family had been ennobled in France. And so he was making connections to his uh, aristocratic roots. The house this time was done by the architectural firm of Bissell and Perrot, specifically Elliston Perrot. Uh, DuPont had had a falling out with his brother-in-law Chandler, so he picked Perrot, who happened to be married to a DuPont cousin of his. It had all the things I'd expect of a Gilded Age mansion, a billiard room, a, an expansive library, an indoor squash court, uh, all sorts of rooms for entertaining, eight bedrooms with ensuite baths. Sadly, Pauline DuPont died in 1902 before construction even got underway. So it fell to Henry Francis DuPont, their son, to oversee the project, the furnishing and creating the interior spaces. This is something that he completely enjoyed doing because he loved a project, especially a building project. Here you see the Red Room as it was known from probably about 1920. Uh, and you get a sense too of how much Henry Francis DuPont liked to use uh, flowers, uh, flowering shrubs to create uh, a background in many of these rooms. Now, I don't wanna neglect uh, Louise DuPont, his sister. Uh, Louise DuPont in 1900 married Frank Crown and Shield from a wealthy Boston and Salem, Massachusetts family. Here's the wedding reception, the wedding party at Winter Tour in 1900. Louise is very significant because of her involvement in historic preservation uh, up and down the East Coast. She helped preserve, restore a number of significant historic sites and also was one of the founders of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And indeed today, the highest honor that organization gives is the Louise DuPont Crown and Shield Award. In the early 1920s, the old family homestead, as they called it, Eleutherian Mills, was put up for sale by the DuPont Company, which actually for a number of years had been using it as sort of a clubhouse for DuPont workers, it wasn't in great shape. Colonel Henry A. DuPont purchased it for his daughter and son-in-law to use when they were in the Wilmington area. Henry Francis got uh, underway as the supervisor for the project, again, loving to oversee uh, restoration, and the architectural firm of Meller and Meggs undertook that work. The interiors uh, were done at Louise's uh, desire to reflect what she thought would most accurately look like the house in the early 1800s when her great grandparents had lived there. But it's really a, a foreshadowing of the colonial revival interest uh, in these pieces and arrangements as a style, not just as and antiquarian collecting. And she's in the lead even before her brother starts doing American decorative art. H.F. DuPont married in 1916, Ruth Wales of Hyde Park, New York. Uh, she was related to the Vanderbilts, neighbors to the Roosevelt, uh, and as they would have said at that time, very socially well connected. They had two daughters, uh, Pauline Louise and Ruth Ellen. And I highly recommend Ruth Ellen DuPont Lord's book, uh, Henry Francis DuPont, A Daughter's Portrait, which really is a wonderful insight into her father, the creation of Winter Tour, his collecting, and just also what it was like to live in this vast house and large estate. Now in the 1930s, HF and Ruth DuPont kind of went on a real estate spending spree. Uh, they would end up with multiple residences, not unusual for a wealthy family of that time. 
1920, they signed contracts for almost a full floor in a co-op apartment in New York City going up near Grand Central Station. This would be their sort of home base for the weekdays, and then often they'd go back to winter tour on the weekends. It's here that H.F. DuPont really starts seriously collecting, but not American pieces, European, 17th, 18th, early 19th century, English, French, Spanish, Italian decorative arts, very elaborate as you can see, much more in the way of, of gold and carving than he would later find in the American pieces. In the early 1920s, they bought five lots in Boca Grande, Florida, on the West Coast on Gasparilla Island, just north of Naples and Fort Myers. This is where Frank and Louise Crowninshield had started going in the winter of 1916. And it was the anti Palm Beach, uh, still very exclusive, very wealthy uh, families, but it was low key. It wasn't all about formal entertaining. It was about sports fishing and tennis and golf and swimming. H.F. and Ruth DuPont found a fisherman's house, which they expanded, added onto at a second floor level. But as you can see from the image on the right, it's really fairly modest in scale compared to certainly winter tour. In each of H.F. DuPont's residences, he followed sort of an appropriate design for where it was located and what its function was summer house, winter house, city apartment, or country place. In Boca Grande, his color palette, palette tends to be coral and turquoise. There are a lot of shell mosaics and he uses glass palm trees and dolphins to line the dining room table that you see here. Well, in October 1923, he had his big sort of uh, moment and changeover to Americana interest. They were visiting the Webb family in Shelburne, Vermont, up on Lake Champlain. While there, the Webbs asked if H.F. and Ruth wanted to see their son and daughter-in-law's house, the Brick House, as it was known. It was a colonial era house that had been largely expanded by the New York architectural firm of Cross and Cross. And it was filled with Electra Webb's collection of uh, country pieces, folk art. And these really took H.F. Uh, DuPont, uh, sort of surprised him, things like this pine cupboard with its pink English transferware ceramics. He was very engaged with this and would later say it's what inspired him to collect American antiques. On that same trip, they went uh, east to Beauport, Henry Davis Sleeper's house in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Now a wonderful site belonging to historic New England, and I highly recommend it if you haven't visited. Here, DuPont saw what Sleeper, an interior decorator, had done using historic architecture that had been salvaged, a variety of antiques and collections to really create assemblages, ensembles of room based on color and form and shape. And this is what DuPont would then try to do in his residences. 1925, they buy land on Meadow Lane in Southampton, about seven acres in a stretch that was just opening up uh, overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. DuPont commissions Cross and Cross, the New York firm, to design about a 50-room house, now in the colonial style. Into it, he starts using salvage historic architecture, just as Sleeper had done at Beauport, to create settings or backdrops for his antiques. In this stage, he's more interested in pine and maple furniture, redware, pewter, tinware, certainly hooked rugs and quilts, uh, sort of an early phase of his collecting and design interest. And you can see from these images too that uh, he's using the various pieces and especially the salvage architecture, creating some bold color uh, schemes in doing that. 
Well, we know him most and winter tour because of this remarkable collection of American decorative arts, now over 90,000 pieces. It has major works like George Washington's Chinese porcelain, a set of six Paul Revere tankards, notable paintings by Peel, Benjamin West, Gilbert Stewards, Copley, and so many others. And it's at Winter Tour that he really started shifting his focus from more of these country and folk pieces. He still enjoyed them and created rooms for them, but he's really beginning to move more into very high style Philadelphia, Newport, Boston, and New York pieces. I think, as he said, really wanting to emphasize uh, the incredible craftsmanship of American artisans. In 1928, he purchased this piece at auction, uh, the Van Pelt uh, high chest, as it, it's known. Uh, as you can see, his scribbled note paying $44,000. That set a record at that time for American antiques, and he beat out William Randolph Hearst to acquire that. On December 31st, 1926, H.A. DuPont died and Henry Francis inherited a 2,500 acre estate made up of 20 different farms, a house at that time of about 55 or so rooms, a fairly large fortune and some beautiful gardens. H.F. starts right away planning an addition onto the house but he never does anything in a small way. So that addition soon grows to over a hundred rooms. It will be nine stories tall at its highest point, built into a hill stop side, constructed like a New York skyscraper, structural steel, reinforced concrete, every modern uh, convenience, new comfort system, even a central sound system. The architect was Albert Ives, a uh, relatively unknown, a young man who had worked in Addison Meisner's office in Florida and then been brought up to the Wilmington area by several of the DuPonts to do additional commissions there. And so it was quite a daunting task for Ives to plan out this very elaborate space. When completed, this is how Winter Tour appeared. With it uh, accompanying it was new landscaping, a large heated swimming pool, and all sorts of additional landscape features. It was rather unlike anything else that had been created in America as a country house and truly still is. Uh, it's considered probably the third or fourth largest house that had been built in America, I guess up until more recent years. To give you a sense of the scale, uh, this is the telephone directory. There were 95 telephone exchanges and round the clock telephone operators to man uh, the system. There were 100 plus buildings on the property and a large number of people lived and worked at Winter Tour. All told, the house, the construction of the house and the landscaping cost over $3 million in those depression years. So uh, quite, uh, quite an undertaking. DuPont had also been spending a million dollars a year for several years running up to 1929, just on the antiques. So for Winter Tour, like Chestertown, he was using historic salvaged architecture. Uh, so much of it came from the South, some from the Mid-Atlantic, and then pieces from New England. He did acquire individual elements, uh, mantelpiece, uh, doorway, that kind of thing. But in several cases, he acquired entire buildings, in part because often when found, they were in derelict condition, had been vandalized. So much of Winter Tour came from Port Royal, a house from 1760 in the Frankfurt section of Philadelphia. You can see it was also used as inspiration for the large wing at Winter Tour. So it went from a two and a half story house to kind of supersized to a four and a half story wing at Winter Tour. 
This was Port Royal when it was discovered by one of H.F. DuPont's uh, antique dealer agents. So you can see it really was in sad condition at that time. Well, when DuPont in 2930 uh, was working with Ives to create the new winter tour, he was by no means uh, a preservationist accurately duplicating every detail from the original structure. You can see the, the sad uh, parlor on the lower right in that black and white photo. You can see the Port Royal parlor is created at winter tour. Uh, dramatically expanding wall space, uh, repositioning in some cases windows and doors. And there's that Van Pelt high chest that he set a record price for uh, on the wall uh, to the right of the color uh, image. So you can see how he is planning these rooms for his collection. We're fortunate to have a number of renderings of the rooms, essentially floor plans, some elevations, done by a man named Leslie Potts. Potts grew up on Winter Tour property. His father was one of the estate workers. And H.F. DuPont saw in Potts a real talent for drawing and sent him to the University of Delaware where he learned draftsmanship. And so uh, he then would have Potts do a lot of these uh, renderings and floor plans. He uh, was respected enough by DuPont that he actually went on to become the overall estate superintendent supervisor for the entire property. But I like to show this image too, because you can see how H.F. DuPont was almost fanatic about symmetry. He would acquire objects in keeping in mind that he so often liked to pair them to create these very balanced rooms. Well, Winter Tour is a creation of the 1930s. H.F. and Ruth and their daughters moved in in April of 1931. And this was the loge, uh, kind of an open air uh, porch that looked out onto the terrace. You can kind of get a sense that DuPont is in many ways very much working in a palette of that time. This is a, a hand colored stereo view uh, image from 1935. So it's very stylish, uh, these uh, Chinese Chippendale style chairs, uh, the blocks, the sort of checkerboard blocks of slate, and then using flowers to kind of highlight the different elements of the space. So if Winter Tour is a period room house, the period rooms are 1930s. They are in no way exacting recreations of 17th, 18th, or early 19th century rooms. Now, H.F. DuPont uh, sort of astounds me in some ways. Uh, I have read and heard that he needed very few hours of sleep a night because he was balancing three great passions, collecting, as we've seen, the garden and landscape, and then the farm. And DuPont actually had real knowledge and training for the garden and the farm. He was a graduate of Harvard University about 1902, uh, but not from the School of Liberal Arts, but from the Bussey Institute, which was the agricultural and horticultural school. So he really was hands-on in creating the gardens at Winter Tour. He worked hand in hand with Marion Coffin, a good friend uh, who from the early 1900s worked with DuPont on so many of these projects. Coffin, probably one of the greatest of the landscape architects in America in that time period. They traveled to England in the early 1900s and to the continent to see other gardens and create their ideas and plans. This was the sunken garden, the first one they worked on together. To my eye, very much uh, a garden of an American country house of the first decade of the 20th century. A pergola changing seasons of flowering bulbs and perennial borders, a lily pond, a very comfortable and elegant space in some ways, and not all that unusual. But what DuPont loved more than anything and Marion Coffin was so keen on was what we'd probably call a naturalistic garden. 
The whole garden today is about 70 acres in, set into natural lands and a much larger landscape. But in the garden, uh, pr the primary part of the garden, there's seven acres of azaleas that bloom in May. In the springtime, literally millions of bulbs on the March bank. And then in April, the sundial garden is filled with flowering shrubs. Winter tour really is a seasonal garden, spring and fall. That's where the design is most focused because the DuPonts were generally in Southampton in the summertime. Marion Coffin did a lot of work uh, creating the setting for the new swimming pool. You see uh, a part of it in the left picture, the black and white. And with that were two bathhouses, one for men, one for women. Uh, and they were done in the Art Deco style. This is one of the things with all our hundreds and thousands of photographs that frustrates me the most. We don't have images of those Art Deco interiors and they were changed later on. So really don't reflect that style. DuPont oversaw this expansive farm uh, land. There were 20 different farms that had been assembled to create the larger winter tour farms. His particular interest was in dairy cattle, and he created what is considered the, the best uh, herd of Holstein Frisian dairy cows in America. Here's the very large dairy barn on top of what was known as Upper Farm Hill. This could house 350 dairy cows at a time. And there was a whole village around it of houses for farm managers. There was the creamery, the head herdsman's cottage. The image on the upper right is H.F. DuPont uh, with one of his prize winning bulls. Winter Tour really was a community. At its height in the 1920s and 30s, there were probably 250 to 300 people who were working and living at Winter Tour. And that's why there were so many different outbuildings, residences. Winter Tour had its own train station. It had its own post office. We still do have the post office. The train station was mainly for freight, but also came in very handy when the DuPont family wanted to send cut flowers, produce, uh, meat, dairy to their other residences. It could be shipped out right from here. Because of this kind of community sense, uh, there was a boarding house you see on the upper left for the, uh, some of the single men working in the farm. In 1917, they added a clubhouse, the color photo on the right, which was the community center. There was a full floor with a stage. There would have been pool tables, ping pong tables, a piano. When movies became available, Saturday night was movie night at the clubhouse. And you can see Winter Tour even had its own baseball team for its workers, and there was a bocce team too. If you came to visit Winter Tour in uh, the 1930s or 40s, you would have entered, entered through the gatehouse on Kennet Pike, which you see in the upper left image, and followed a nearly mile long drive through meadowland, pasture land, woodland, and then emerge and see this very large house at the top of the hill. Depending on the time of year, even if you stayed in the same guest room you'd been in before, it might look quite different. DuPont would change the textiles in these rooms two, three, or even four times a year to echo the seasons. Here we have a bedroom in spring, the sort of spring yellows and greens. And here we have it in wintertime, reflecting the kind of cooler palette of the outside at that time. The staff in the house alone was over 34 people. The entire eighth floor was filled with uh, rooms for staff, bedrooms and bathrooms, and various storage areas. And here are just a few of the people who made winter tour work. Uh, in many cases, multiple generations of the same family uh, lived, grew up, and worked at Winter Tour. 
For a country house party weekend, which was carefully staged by HF and Ruth DuPont, uh, he would select flowers from his four acre cutting garden. There were 11 men who just tended the cutting garden. He picked the flowers and then deciding on those, he would select from one of his 50 sets of china for the table and from thousands of linen place uh, mats, napkins uh, in a variety of colors and styles to create this sort of memorable setting for his dinner party. For entertaining the big events, weddings, anniversaries, or in this case, a debutante party, the pool was the favorite site. And you see here set up for the 1935 debutante party of their eldest daughter, Pauline Louise. Hundreds of people came for dinner, dancing, and stayed into the very wee hours of the morning. H.F. DuPont, his daughter said, never would leave anything up to uncertainty. And so it was June. There might be a thunderstorm. It might just be a rainy day. He created an entire village of tents that were all set up with tables, chairs, place settings, flowers, ready to go if it had rained. Happily, it was a beautiful evening, so the whole event could take place outside. Winter Tour was kind of like a five-star resort. Uh, there were tennis courts, croquet lawns, the heated swimming pool, and DuPont had his own private nine-hole golf course. Well, by the mid-1930s, he was beginning to focus on the next step for Winter Tour. Interestingly, in 1930, he actually created a not-for-profit educational corporation with the idea that someday Winter Tour would become a museum. By the mid-30s, he wasn't entertaining quite as much. It was the Depression. So he started thinking about replacing rooms, taking out some of the uh, sort of back-of-the-house spaces, and making them into settings for his antiques. Now he turned to the architect Thomas Waterman, a noted preservation architect who had worked at Colonial Williamsburg, to take the lead. One of the first things Waterman did was rip out HF's father's very elaborate marble staircase from 1903, replacing it with a new staircase, which as HF called it, Americanized the space. So still very modern in construction, structural steel to create kind of the foundation, but then applied with historic architectural details rescued from a house in North Carolina. You can also see here DuPont's eye for shape, the elliptical staircase, the elliptical backs to the settees and to the chairs. As I said, there were all sorts of back of the house spaces for the entertaining functions. Uh, there were multiple rooms for china and linens, two rooms just for flower arranging with walk-in refrigerators. Uh, my favorite, the ice cream room where uh, special frozen treats I think were kept to be served out on the terrace or in the reception rooms. And then all sorts of servants dining rooms and living rooms and spaces. So by the late 30s, DuPont's ripping these out and Waterman is redesigning them. One of the notable houses in Philadelphia that was taken down as we were losing houses sort of in the Society Hill area was the Stamper Blackwell House. And in 1908, interiors from that house actually were installed in a new country house in uh, Rosemont on Philadelphia's main line, a colonial revival style house for the McFadden family. Well, after Franklin McFadden's death in 1937, uh, H.F. DuPont purchased from his widow some of those details that had come out of the Blackwell house. And he installed them at Winter Tour in his Blackwell parlor, probably the, the tour de force of architectural detail and carving in Winter Tour today. The badminton court was his next target, in Dork, uh, badminton court gymnasium created in the 1930-31 expansion, Georgian revival style with a viewing balcony. 
DuPont in the late 40s rips that out to create a space for his facades, a courtyard of four historic facades. And you see it here probably as it looked about the early 1950s. He also would use this as a place when it was still his residence to show home uh, movies to his guests, actually first run movies from New York. And here's another view as it was changed once again in the early 1960s. DuPont was always tweaking the house, the collections, the settings, even after it became a museum in 1951. The bowling alley on the third floor level became Shop Lane, historic storefronts with a variety of collections. Well, in the early 1940s, on a very limited basis, visitors were allowed to see some of the house in the collections. I think a lot of this was done actually for tax reasons, but DuPont also wanted to see how people reacted to his collection. He even created a small exhibit of 18th century Philadelphia chairs in that badminton court. Well, he was continuing to really think about Winter Tour's future as a historic museum, as a collection of great objects. Uh, he was so fascinated by places like Mount, Mount Vernon and some of the other great historic sites. And by late 1940s, he decided it was time to move ahead and turn Winter Tour, the house with the collections, into a museum. And so he rapidly got plans underway, pushing his people to have it open November 1951 for the first visitor. Winter Tour had never been published up to that time. And so not surprisingly, the magazine Antiques was given the opportunity to do a full issue on the rooms. He also allowed Vogue and House and Garden and other publications to show photos of the interiors. And we have a wonderful series of shots by the really noted photographer, Andre Cortez, that were done for those publications. But in a surprising way, he also let a lot of the popular periodicals in. Uh, this is Saturday Evening Post, 1951, doing an extensive article. I do think, because he was modest in many ways, that. Uh, their kind of promotional uh, poster, America's $20 million home winter tour, uh, must have given him a little bit of pause. But I think he was just delighted with the response to his museum. Well, because HF and Ruth DuPont were moving out of that very large house, they needed somewhere to live. So they looked across the way to the tenant farmhouse that had been built by the Bittermans in 1838 as a tenant farmhouse for this extensive farm. His first plan was to just expand it, add a significant wing. Waterman started the uh, drawings for that, but fairly soon it was realized it was not in good condition and there was no way, the, as H.F. Uh, DuPont uh, wanted to develop the program for the house and how he wanted to live, it would work. So it was transformed instead into a brand new house, English Regency in style, 50 rooms. Uh, for 1951, still in a very different era, 11 servants' bedrooms and bathrooms, very formal spaces. For the furnishings, he left his American pieces up in the house that had become the museum. He drew on the great European antiques that had been in that Park Avenue apartment. He closed that up in World War II and put the objects in storage. So the Winter Tour Cottage, as it was nicknamed, really was kind of a, a glimpse into the past of Park Avenue apartment of the 1920s. It was here H.F. and Ruth DuPont lived uh, till the late 1960s, Ruth dying in 67, H.F. DuPont in 1960. 1952 was a significant year, just one year after the museum opened. Uh, the gardens are open for a springtime tour with 20 of the most important rooms of the house. Thousands of people came on weekends to see the azaleas in bloom and get a glimpse of this house, which had such a long waiting list for the actual tours. 
That year was also the year that the Winter Tour Program in Early American Culture with the University of Delaware was created, still the signature program for training in American material culture. Well, as I mentioned earlier, when I kind of gave that aerial view of Winter Tour, uh, by 1956 or so, he knew he needed more space already. So he commissioned his cousin, Victorine DuPont Holmesy, and her husband, Samuel Holmesy, to add what we know as the South Wing. Holmesy's uh, very well known for this sort of blend of traditional and modern architecture. This would also house a series of period rooms that could be visited without an advanced reservation. Well, the interiors are striking in many ways. In the lower right image, you see the rotunda, the auditorium, sort of a parabolic shape. Uh, and you may notice the furniture looks rather contemporary. DuPont furnished this building and others primarily with Knoll and Herman Miller furniture. And the rotunda itself is very reminiscent of Saarinen's work uh, in corporate headquarters and other architects' commissions in that mid-century mode. The library, again, you could be stepping absolutely into uh, Mad Men from, from the 1960s. Now, people often say, well, why would DuPont allow this? Well, DuPont actually funded this oversaw the selection of the architect and gave his blessing to the furniture. He wanted to show the continuing evolution of design and furniture uh, and make Winter Tour sort of a very uh, vibrant and alive place. The period rooms, of course, were traditional. Starting in the 17th century, a tour that went up two different floors to a third floor, uh, doing a chronological step through time in America. In 1961, the spring tour had grown so big, they needed somewhere for people to eat. They needed restrooms and a ticketing space. So uh, HF went back to the Holmesies and asked them to create what would become known as the pavilion. Uh, it's our visitor center still to today. The architectural style was described at the time as, as Bay Region, uh, which had, was becoming popular. This kind of blend uh, that was sort of arts and crafts with strong Asian influence. Uh, Lewis Mumford was the one who really coined the, the phrase Bay Region. And it's often said that there's some inspiration of Frank Lloyd Wright in this style too. Furniture again, Noel and Herman Miller. February 1961 was a, a really memorable and important time for H.F. DuPont. First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy asked him to chair the Fine Arts Committee to restore the White House rooms, something he took on with uh, great enthusiasm. And you see on the right, that's H.F. and Ruth DuPont in the Red Room after it was restored. Back to Winter Tour projects in 1966, a 350-seat auditorium is added, the Copeland Lecture Hall. Again, the Holmesies are the architects. And note the, the wonderful use of kind of these bands of color on the upholstery to create sort of a, a strong visual statement. Also, if you look at the use of wood, uh, the white ceilings, the inset panels, um, I don't know ab about some of you, but to me, it just has a bit of feel of Frank Lloyd Wright to me. It, it does sort of remind me of the little house, the, the room in the Metropolitan Museum. Well, the final project H.F. DuPont funded was the creation of the Crown and Shield building, the library and conservation studios. This was the first proposal. The architect was Winthrop Jones, a uh, sort of a uh, very pleasant Georgian revival building, but clearly it was not what DuPont had in mind. So they uh, left that uh, scheme behind and selected Shepley Bullfinch from Boston to create the Crown and Shield building. Again, sort of referencing the other buildings on the property and the traditional architecture, but a very modern take. 
connecting the museum and the library was this wonderful long glass corridor. And again, to me, it just sort of is evocative of Mies or Philip Johnson's glass house of that era. About 20 years ago, that glass corridor was filled in with uh, cases for the Campbell's Soup Tureen collection, a wonderful gift from the Campbell's Soup Company, uh, which are shown so well in that space. But I kind of lament and miss that wonderful open glass uh, room that once connected the house to the library. Last building was added, I guess appropriately postmodern, uh, by Hartman and Cox of Washington, D.C., the galleries building to create spaces for changing exhibitions and to highlight collections. Well, Winter Tour today, if HF and Ruth DuPont came back to see Winter Tour, so much of it would look the same. It's not 2,500 acres, but it's still nearly 1,000 acres. The gardens and landscape are preserved in HF's uh, manner. Uh, we have great archival material to very meticulously preserve what we have here. The buildings are also being preserved uh, to reflect HF's time. But it's also a modern museum and garden and library. We have concerts on the lawn, at least we did, in, pre-pandemic uh, phases. We had lots of school programs, two graduate programs, one in American material culture, one in uh, uh, the University of Delaware program in, in art conservation. And we have all sorts of ongoing lectures, programs, and exhibitions. And like everybody, and like tonight, we've been doing a lot of virtual lectures and even virtual conferences. So I hope you'll come and see Winter Tour. I am happy we are open. The, the grounds have been a wonderful uh, sanctuary for people uh, for many months now, the ability to walk in, in this beautiful setting. But our exhibition galleries are open. A limited number of people are safely able to see the house tours. And we're looking forward to the day when we can welcome so many more people back. So thank you so much for joining me to, to hear about Winter Tour. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, uh, we have some, uh, we've, uh, if you have questions, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A and I will do my best uh, to dig them out of there and, and give them to Jeff. Um, let me just begin with a, uh, uh, using my prerogative to um, ask my own question. Um, it's always been difficult to, I mean, in part, it's the question of where is Delaware? Where is the state of Delaware? Is it in the north? Is it in the south? Is it part of Philadelphia? Is it part of metropolitan New York? Um, you note, um, and it's quite distinctive when you look at the collections at Winter Tour, that there's a lot from the south. Um, and so, you know, my, so my sort of, you know, culturally, where is, uh, where is Winter Tour? Where, where, is du, where, where did DuPont live? Yeah. yeah, so of course, Winter Tour does fall between all these different places. And I think the earlier days of collecting were much more focused uh, on uh, sort of mid-Atlantic New England. And then he started branching out much more into collecting actual uh, Southern decorative arts as we've continued to do today. But the house uh, is sort of, in many ways more reflective of Philadelphia or Chester County, the earlier phases of it. And then it goes full tilt, uh, as I said, Gilded Age millionaire. I'd say the DuPonts who lived at Winter Tour were much more connected to New York or Washington DC than they were to Philadelphia. And that's partly because um, Henry Algernon's wife was a New Yorker, HF's wife was a New Yorker, uh, they had a very large house on Massachusetts Avenue in Washington, D.C. Their friends were ambassadors, diplomats, and in terms of their social set, so many of their friends were collecting very high-style English and French furniture and interior architecture. So they're kind of the, this blend, but like Delaware, they fall as this wonderful mix, I guess, yeah, that's right. a mashup. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's the I, I always think of Delaware with what is it um, uh, oysters and chicken 
um, there's some kind of get a sort of um, a couple of questions have come in. One um, one from Martha Berg who asks how big an endowment was left for the ongoing development and preservation of the complex. When um, ATF died in, in 1969, I think the uh, endowment back then was probably. 40 or $50 million. And it has certainly grown many times. It's had its, its uh, back and forward uh, sort of moments, but it was a substantial amount of money. Now, if we're gonna have a little bit of DuPont jealousy, it was a fraction of what PS DuPont left for Longwood and AI DuPont left for, for Nemours, but it was very, very substantial. And the family continued to be very generous after HFD. Pond's death and still are today. Um, a, a very specific, a very a, a question from Marlene Kessler: Was it Dupont? Was Dupont the one who built the largest pipe organ in North America? Uh, good question. It was his cousin P.S. Dupont, Pierre Samuel Dupont at Longwood, and you can still go and hear that today. Uh, especially at Christmas time, and they do a lot of concerts. I think maybe last year they didn't uh, with the pandemic, but that was the largest Aeolian organ that, that had been built. And just a quick little side note is the uh, salesman from Aeolian really tried to sell H.F. DuPont a, a big organ for his expansion in 1930-31. And DuPont, who was always, HF, who was always kind of one step ahead on things said, now I don't need a pipe organ. I'm putting in the first electronic sound system in a major house <laughs> with speakers at the swimming pool, the golf course, in the guest rooms. And I can even pipe in the Metropolitan or or uh, Orchestra uh, from New York City on the weekends and play that for my guests. And that, that sort of prompts a question that was in the back of my head about this. Obviously, the DuPont Corporation is an enormous uh, industrial powerhouse um, with, an or with great innovation in technology. And I, it does seem that, that there are some components of this, the telephone exchange, what you're just talking about, the sound system, that are remarkably up to date. How do you, how do you reckon that balance between collecting the 18th century and you know, and and sort of engineering the twentieth century. I, you know, it's interesting. I think it's like a lot of these American American successful businessmen who also played gentleman farmer or loved to play country squire. They made their money in industry and and uh, manufacturing. Uh, they loved every modern convenience. Sort of a contrast to the old English country squires. Uh, but then they put on this facade of gentlemanly leisure and, and country life. H.F. DuPont was just, um, in a way, you know, if he was alive today, he would have had every new iPhone the minute it came out. <laughs> right. He loved the latest thing and yeah. sharing it with people. So as long as he could disguise it with historic architecture, uh, moldings or details, then I think he was comfortable. It was the veneer of age disguising all this uh, sort of newfangled stuff. Um, Thorpe Merkel asks, um, what is the future emphasis of Winterthur given its current mission? And I'm, I'm not quite sure what, I mean, what its yeah, strategic um, plan Winter is. Tour is doing two things right now. Like a lot of places, we have a lot of master planning going on. Uh, we're definitely looking to expand the story of the land, the estate, uh, the farm. I'm working particularly, as I touched on a bit today, on the community. We had hundreds of people living here, very diverse background, ethnic background, uh, fantastic stories, a lot of oral histories. So we want to share and tell more of that. We also are sort of reinterpreting our collections. I mean, H.F. DuPont was collecting great American decorative arts. We're trying to re-examine them, go back and look for the hidden stories. We have a really great uh, committee right now uh, looking at DAI, uh, AI to see how we can move Winter Tour further into the future and engage more people and, and tell more stories. So with our graduate programs, 
uh, with really strong uh, educational mission. I think we're we're primed to move forward while we're still telling the stories that people enjoy, but also uh, sort of layering in a whole new level of opportunities. Uh, Lois Kimmelman and um, and Barbara Aronson send in their um, plaudits. They can uh, thank you for the for the wonderful talk, um, and um, and it does seem like we have answered the questions that we've got. Um, and I think it only um, remains for us to say, quite seriously, Jeff, thank you very very much for bringing um, this part of our history, um, this part of our extraordinary architectural uh, heritage here in the Philadelphia area to light. Um, as uh, as I said at the beginning, this is the um, this is this is the first of a series of lectures. Um, we will um, in March be hearing uh, we'll be hearing from David Hollenberg talking about um, restoring and maintaining uh, other modern masterpieces. Um, and later in the spring, we'll hear from Derek Gilman uh, who mm -hmm. about the creation of the new Barnes Foundation on the Parkway. So there's more to come. And, and as they say, uh, we'll be in touch. We'll keep, uh, we'll keep you up to date. Again, if you'd like to go shopping uh, for a perfect Valentine's Day presents, um, the gift shop is, is open uh, 24 hours at, uh, at Beth Shalom Preservation, uh, at bethshalompreservation.org. Uh, and, um, and by all means, uh, if you feel inclined, uh, please uh, uh, join the foundation to be part of this project. Um, this is a great monument of Philadelphia's architectural history, um, and we intend to bring it alive with all kinds of connections to other great architectural stories. Um, and, and thanks to Jeff for getting us started in such an extraordinary way. Um, and I see, I see, um, I, I see uh, Jill has appeared to take a bow. Thank you, Jill, for, uh, uh, for your contribution to this. And Stacy there is, is hiding behind um, the, the, the distinctive... Uh, a uh, uh, hieroglyph of, of Beth Shalom. Um, uh, thank you all. Thank you all. And, um, and thanks for joining us. Uh, good night to everybody. Good night. Thank you, Jeff and David. Can David hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. So over um, 120. Great. Actually, 124. So, right. So, did I thought I saw 129 at last night? You probably saw. You're probably um, correct. Yeah, no, it's, it's, um, I think we're, we're still live here. So, if, don't take, you know, <laughs> that's okay. Those, those 37 of you who are still there, thanks for sticking <laughs> on. <That's> exactly. <laughs> part of one. This is a, um, well, just, but, but a, a, a lovely talk. And, um, thank you. Uh, and the slideshow it was beautiful. Yeah. Oh. Well, you know, as I always, you know, I have to say, it's it's always cheating when you use pretty things, you know, <laughs> and it, it gives you an unfair advantage. <laughs> it it was, uh, you know, so ornate to think that people lived like that. It's well, not beautiful. everyone did. It has to be said. <laughs> well, you know, but, but well, says, and it, apropos they, of the. The question that was asked is is one of the things that we are trying to explore at Winter Tour is, I, I won't call it just relevancy, but making a connection today. You know, everybody loves to go into the Newport mansions or Biltmore or something, but it's got to be more than that. You, yeah. There have to be the other stories and how was this even possible and who took care of these places. And so I think that's what really... Um, you know, so engaged with right now and trying to to broaden out that whole story. Yeah, I do think that. I mean, I think well, as you as you certainly well know. I mean, the challenge today is to tell the larger, more complicated stories behind every artifact. Um, that uh, you know, it it it's an 18th century chair, uh, but it had an interesting life in the 19th century, or the the kind of a you know that those sorts of those sorts of continuing stories. Um, well, thank you, um, thank you all. Um, I'm going to. Um, I, uh, I'm sorry that the um, the the uh, that I had these strange internet problems, but we had problems uh, through the day. It seemed like everything had settled down, but strangely, just moving into this other room um, uh, fixed it. 
but um, it wasn't as pretty a background. So, but, anyway, <laughs> but anyhow, thank you again, Jeff, and thank you, thank Jill. You. Thank and, you. And um, we'll be in touch about getting things going. And and as I said, Derek promised to do it. He just didn't want to sort of set you know, set himself to a date he's, yet. So he's, David Hollenberg is March twenty third, and Derek is in June. Right. Great. Right. Right. Yeah, that's a big great. Yeah. So, Ray, hooray. Okay. And, um, okay. Uh, thank, Jeff, you. Thanks. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thanks. Have good, a good night. Good night. Have I'm a good rest of the evening. Bye bye. Bye bye.